Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Skyrim. Last time we kept going through Falkreath, clearing out Corpse Light Farm, the Hall of Dead, and Dengear's house. Today we're going to wrap up, starting with Grave Concoctions. Let's head inside. Much like many of the places we visited, there's nothing we can do for, for the shopkeeper Zarya to make things in here free to take. But she's very easy to steal from because she likes to sit in that corner and work on our potions. Well, let's just start swiping stuff. Now there's a book here on the ground. It's an alchemy skill book we haven't read yet. Dererum Dyrenes. I've already maxed out alchemy, but let me pull it off the book list. And as far as free skill boosts, I had five left for alchemy. Now I have four. There's only one skill book left and three quests. So, Dererum Dyrenes by Vorian Dyreni. I am 611 years old. I have never had children of my own, but I have many nieces and nephews and cousins who have been raised with the tales and traditions of our ancient, illustrious, and occasionally notorious clan, the Dyreni. Few families in Tamriel can boast so many famous figures, wielding so much power over the fate of so many. Our warriors and kings are stuff of legend, and it is not to dismiss their honor and achievements to say you have heard quite enough about them. I myself have never picked up a sword or written an important law, but I am part of a lesser known but still important Dyreni tradition, the way of the wizard. My own autobiography would be of little interest to posterity, though my nephew, nieces, and cousins indulge me to tell wild tales of life in the chaotic second era of Tamriel, but I have a few ancestors whose stories should be told. They may have changed history as we know it as dramatically as my better known relatives, but their names are in danger of being forgotten. <clears throat> Most recently, Lysandus, the king of Daggerfall, was able to conquer his ancient enemies of Sentinel in part thanks to his court sorceress, Medora Dyreni. Her father, Javran Dyreni, was imperial battle mage to the court of the Dunmer Empress of Tamriel, Kataria, assisting her in creating peace in the time of turmoil. His great-great-grandfather, Peladil Dyreni, had a similar role with the first potentate, and encouraged the Guild Act, without which we would not have all the professional organizations we have today. His ancestor, many times back, was the witch Raven Dyreni, who with her better-known cousins Aiden and Rhiane, brought an end to the tyranny of the latter Elysian Empire. Before the Sigix of Arteum, it is said, she created the art of enchantment, learning how to bind a soul into a gem and use that to ensorcel all manners of weaponry. But it is the story of an ancestor even more ancient, more distant than Raven, I wish to tell. Asliel Dyreni harkens back to the humble beginnings of our clan, in the tiny farming village of Tyragel on the banks of the river Kaomis, which was then called the Dyren, hence the family name. Like all on Somerset Isle in those days, he was a simple planter of the fields. But while others only grew enough to sustain their immediate kin, even distant cousins of the Dyrenes worked together. They would decide as a group which fields were best for wheat, orchard, vine, livestock, or apiary, and thereby always have the best yields of any farm which worked alone, doing the best as it could with what it had. Asliel had a particularly poor farm for most kinds of agriculture, but small herbs found its stony, loneless, acidic soil very comfortable. Out of necessity more than anything else, he became an expert on all manners of herbs. For the most part, of course, they were used in flavoring cooking, but as you know, hardly any plant grows on the surface of our world without a magical potential. Even so long ago, witches were already in existence. It would be ridiculous for me to suggest that Asliel Dyreni invented alchemy. What he did, what we can all be grateful for, is that he formulated it into an art and science. There were no witches' covens in Tyragel, and of course, there would be no mages' guild yet for thousands of years, so people would come to him for cures. He learned for himself the exact formula for combining black lichen and rue brush to create a cure for all manners of poison, and the amount of willow anther to crush and mix with chokeweed to cure diseases. There were few much greater threats in Tyragel in those peaceful Hello? days than disease or accidental poisonings. Sorry for the pause. Yes, there were some dark forces in the wilderness, trolls, chimera, the occasional malevolent fairy folk, and will-o'-the-wisp. 
but even the youngest, most foolish Altmer knew how to avoid them. There were, however, a few unusual threats which Asliel had a hand in defeating. One of the tales told of him that I believe to be true is how he was brought a young niece who had been suffering from an unknown disease. Despite his ministrations, she grew weaker and weaker every morning. Finally, he gave her a bitter-tasting drink, and the next morning ashes were found all around her bed. A vampire had been feeding on the poor girl, but Asliel's potion had turned her very blood into poison, without harming her in the least. If only this formula had not been lost in the mists of history. This would have been enough to make him a minor but significant figure in the annals of early Somerset, but at that point in history, a barbarian tribe called the Lochfar had found their way down the Dyren River, and recognized Tyragel as a rich target for raids. The Dyreni, not being warriors yet but simple farmers, were helpless and could only flee and watch the Lochfar take the best of their crops, raid after raid. Asliel, however, had been experimenting with the vampire dust, and brought his cousins to him with a plan. The next time the Lochvar were sighted on the Dyron, the word went out and all the most able-bodied came to Asliel's laboratory. When the barbarians arrived in Tyregel, they found the farms deserted, and assumed that all had fled as usual. As they set about stealing the bounty, they suddenly found themselves under attack by invisible forces. Believing the Dyreni farms to be haunted, they ran away very quickly. They attempted a few more raids, for their greed would always eventually overpower their fear, and each time they were set upon, set upon by attackers who they could not see. As barbaric as they were, they were not stupid, and they changed their mind about the source of their defeat. It could not be that the farms were haunted, because the crops were still being tended and harvested, and the animals seemed to show no fear. The Lochvar decided to send a scout to the farm to see if he could spy their secrets. The scout sent word back to the Lochvar that the Dyreni farms were populated with flesh and blood entirely visible Altmer. He continued to watch as his barbarian cohorts moved, to, moved down the river, and he saw the elderly and children flee for the hills, while the able-bodied farmers and their wives went to Asliel's laboratory. He saw them go in, he saw no one come out. As usual, the Lochvar were repelled by invisible forces, but their scout soon told them what he saw happening in the laboratory. The next night, two of the Lochvar approached Asliel's farm very stealthily and managed to kidnap him without alerting the rest of the Dyreni. The Lochvar chieftain, knowing that the farmers could no longer count on the alchemist to make them invisible, considered an immediate, ta considered an immediate attack on the farms, but he was a vengeful sort and felt he had been humiliated by these simple farmers. A crafty plan emerged in his mind. What if the Dyreni, who always saw his barbarian tribe coming, for once did not? Imagine the slaughter if no one even had a chance to flee. The scout had told the chieftain that Asliel had used the dust of a vampire to make the farmers invisible, but he was not sure what the other ingredient had been. He described an incandescent powder that Asliel had mixed into the dust. Asliel, of course, refused to help the Lochvar, but they were experts in torture as well as pillage, and he knew he would have to talk or die. Finally, after hours of torture, he agreed to tell them what the incandescent powder was. He did not know the name, but he called it glow dust, the only remains of a slain Will-o'-the-Wisp. He told them they would need a lot of it if they wanted to turn the whole tribe invisible for the raid. The Lochvar grumbled that not only did they have to find and kill a vampire to attain his dust, but find and kill several Will-o'-the-Wisps to get theirs. In a few days' time, they came back with the ingredients the alchemist asked for. The chieftain, not being a complete idiot, made Asliel taste the potion first. He did as he was told and turned invisible, demonstrating that it did truly work. The chieftain put him to work, creating more. No one apparently noticed that while he did, he was nibbling on black lichen and rue brush. The Lochvar took the potion as he doled it out, and soon, but not too soon that they didn't suffer, they were all dead. The scout who had seen Asliel mixing the invisibility potion had apparently mistook the glow of the candlelight in the laboratory for an incandescence which the second ingredient of the invisibility potion did not possess. The second ingredient was actually dull, simple redwort, one of the most common herbs in Tamriel. When they had insisted during torture that Asliel tell them what the incandescent powder was, Asliel remembered that he had once experimentally mixed glow dust and vampire dust together and created a p and, to, and created a powerful poison. It was simple enough to steal a little red wart from the barbarian's camp, mix that with the vampire and glow dust mixture, 
and create a potion that was in fact an invisibility poison. After curing himself, he gave the poison to the barbarians. The Lokvar, being dead, never again raided the Dyreni farms, and having no other enemies, they were able to grow more and more prosperous and powerful. Generations later, they left Somerset and began their historic adventures on the Tamriel mainland. Asliel Dyreni, because of his excellence as an alchemist, was invited to Arteum and became a Sigic. It is not known how many more of the common formulas we know today were invented by him there, but I have no doubt the science and art of alchemy as we know it today would not exist without him. But that is all in the distant past. Asliel's innovations, like my modest ones, like the achievements of the Dyrenes throughout history, are but a stepping stone to the wonders which will come in the future. I wish I could be there to witness them, but if I can only share some of the past with the children of Dyreni and the children of Tamriel, then I will consider my life well spent. There we go. Oh, a few regular food ingredients and clutter up here. I already did that, so let's work our way over here now. She's got some pretty valuable ingredients but none of them are any use to me anymore. Unless she happens to have, of course, saber cat teeth. Which I don't think she will, but you never know. Let's go up here. Now let's go here. Someone new? Perhaps someone looking for me to mix something up for them? Okay, yeah, she's going to her shop counter now, so let's just get behind her. And there's another new book here behind the counter. On the Great Collapse. On the Great Collapse. Let me go find it on my list right quick. To the esteemed Jarl Valdemar of Winterhold, first, please allow me to offer my most sincere condolences. I understand that you, like many others, have lost family and you have my deepest sympathies. I also understand that some on your council have placed the blame for this horrible disaster on my colleagues at the college. While I can certainly appreciate the shock at the scope of recent events, and the desire to comprehend what has happened, I must strongly urge you to consider the full situation. You know as well as any the college's history and reputation in Winterhold. It has long been a source of pride for your city, a unique fixture in Skyrim. Some of the greatest wizards have studied here, and the college has always promoted positive relations with the other provinces of Tamriel. It is well known that those relations have been, shall we say, strained over the last few decades. After the Oblivion Crisis, it was only natural that the people of Skyrim showed a distrust for mages, even though the vast majority of us actively worked to counter the actions of the Mythic Dawn cult. The College expected such a reaction and hoped that that distrust would fade over time. And then the Red Year. No one foresaw the explosion of Red Mountain or the devastating effect it would have on the Dunmer culture. Your predecessor was kind enough to welcome many of the refugees, particularly those who could contribute to the college's studies. We were quite grateful. When Solstheim was generously offered to the Dunmer as a new home, I was as surprised as any. I did not, however, share the apparent expectation that all Dark Elves would leave Skyrim. It did not go unnoticed that many in Winterhold were unhappy at how many mages chose to stay at the college rather than relocate. And now, the storms that have racked the coast of Skyrim for close to a year have finally broken, but at great cost to us all. This great collapse that has devastated Winterhold was unexpected, I assure you. That the college has remained unaffected is only a testament to the protective magics placed around it so long ago. It in no way implies that we were somehow prepared specifically for this event, and is certainly no indication that the college was somehow responsible. I certainly would never hold you accountable for the gossip spread amongst the people of Winterhold. I would urge you, though, to not allow that gossip to take root and become a commonly held belief. I do not wish to see our relationship crumble like Winterhold has. As I assure you, the college will remain here a very, very long time. Your persistent advocate, Archmage Deneth. Well, there you go. Now let's look at our table. Just a few more pretty valuable ingredients. 
Now let's pick her pocket and talk to her. Oop. Come on now, really? There we go. All right, Zaria. Falkreath's warriors always return, one way or another. If either these Nords or Imperials had some red in their blood, this war would be over. Someone new, perhaps someone looking for me to mix something up for them? If either these Nords or Imperials had some red in their blood, this war would be over. There aren't many Red Guards in Skyrim. What brought you here? Well, my family back in Hammerfell didn't approve of my interest in lethal poisons and death in general. So I left and wandered north. When I found this town with its huge cemetery, I felt right at home. I opened the shop and I've never looked back. This is where I belong. Why name your store Grave Concoctions? I know, it's a bit strange. Not exactly a name to bring comfort to the sick and ailing who come to buy a poultice or salve. But what you must understand about Falkreath is that our town is defined, for better or worse, by the large and ancient cemetery here. That's why the inn is called Dead Man's Drink, the farm is called Corpse Light Farm, and so on. I suppose it's sort of a running joke. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. Oh, a bucket. Almost missed it. All right, next we're going to do the barracks. We're going to clear out everything there, but we are not going to talk to Sinding. Not yet. We will leave him for later. Go and get on the horse, because I want to end like the general store, since they actually have kind of the same layout. I want to enter the barracks through the top floor. So let's head there. Been going about 20 minutes, we're making good time. <clears throat> no way to make friends with anybody here. So everything just has to be stolen. I'd be a lot more, and a lot happier with a belly full of me. I'm a little surprised we're hidden, but let's go ahead and clear that table off. I mostly deal with petty thievery and drunken drawers. Been too long since we've had a good bandit raid. 100 sneak. What do you need? With stealth and my enchanted boots makes a big difference. Alright, steal from the chest, and then get another new book, The Legendary Sankator. It's another two-handed skill book, but don't be deceived, it is different from the Battle of Sankator. So let me take it off the book list, jump over to free boosts, offer two-handed. I had five boosts left, so that's down to four. Two skill books and two quests. The Legendary City of Sankator by Matera Chapel, or Chapel. During the Skyrim Conquests, first era 240 to 415, ambitious Highland Earls, envious of the conquests and wealth of the, their northern cousins in High Rock and Morrowind, looked south over the ramparts of the Gerald Mountains for their opportunities. The Gerald Mountains proved to be too great a barrier, and northern Cyrodiil too poor a prize to reward full-scale Nord invasions. However, Alicia hired many ambitious Nord and Breton warbands as mercenaries, with the promises of rich lands and trade concessions. Once settled among the victorious Elysian Cyrodiils, the Nord and Breton warriors and battle mages were quickly assimilated into the comfortable and prosperous Nibinian culture. Elysia received the divine inspiration for her slave rebellion at Sankrator, and here she founded her holy city. Sankrator's mines provided some wealth, but the poor soils and harsh climate of the remote mountain site meant it must be supplied with food and goods from the heartlands. Further, located on one of the few passes through the Geralds, its fortunes were subject to the instability of relations with Skyrim. When relations were good with Skyrim, it prospered through trade and alliance. When relations were bad with Skyrim, it was vulnerable to siege and occupation by the Nords. With the decline of the Elysian Order circa 1st era 2321, 
the seat of religious rule of Cyrodiil moved south to the imperial city, but Sancrator remained a mountain fortress and major religious center until the rise of the Septim dynasty. In second era 852, the city was suffering under one of the periodic occupations by Skyrim and High Rock invaders. King Kublikane sent his new general, Talos, to recapture the city and expel the northern invaders. During his siege, Sancrator was destroyed and abandoned. Realizing the strategic weakness of the site, General Talos, later Tiber Septim, resolved to abandon Sancrator, and during his reign, no effort was made to rebuild the city or citadel. Elysian historians asserted that Sancrator was magically concealed and defended by the gods. Records of Sancrator's repeated defeats and occupations by northern invaders gives the lie to this assertion. The entrance to the citadel was indeed concealed by sorcery, and the citadel and its labyrinthine subterranean complex were defended by magical traps and illusions, but their secrets were betrayed to besieging Nords by the Breton enchanters who crafted them. One enduring feature of the legend of Sancrator is the ancient tombs of the Riemann emperors. Following the defeat of the Akaviri invaders, Sancrator enjoyed a brief resurgence of wealth and culture under Riemann Cyrodiil and his descendants, Riemann II and Riemann III. Tracing his ancestry to St. Elysia and following the tradition that St. Elysia was buried in the catacombs beneath Sancrator, footnote 1, there is a competing tradition that St. Elysia is buried on the site of the Temple of the One in the Imperial City. The actual resting place of St. Elysia is unknown. Riemann built splendid funerary precincts in the depths of the ancient citadel underpassages. Here the last Riemann Emperor, Riemann III, was buried in his tomb with the Amulet of Kings. During the sack of Sancrator, General Talos is said to have recovered the Amulet of Kings from the tomb of Riemann III. Theologians ascribe the long centuries of political and economic turmoil following the collapse of the Riemann dynasty to the loss of the Amulet of Kings, and associate the renaissance of the Cyrodiilic Empire in the Third Era with Tiber Septim's recovery of the Amulet from Riemann III's tomb. Sancrator has lain in ruins since the beginning of the Third Age, and the surrounding region is virtually uninhabited. Now all communications with the north are through the passes at Coral and Bruma, and Sancrator's citadel and underpassages have become the refuge of various savage goblin tribes. There you go. Oop. Let's just keep on working our way over. And that's it for the top floor, so let's head downstairs. I find your hand in my pocket. I'm going to cut it. Keep your hands to yourself. Alright, what about this shelf? Alright, we got that side all clear. Let's go over here. Then we'll need to go downstairs to the barracks, or to the jail. We're in the barracks. Killing before you're killed, we've already read. So, let's not talk to Sending yet, but let's do clear out the jail. So Sending's over there in what they call the pit. We're gonna leave him be for the moment. There's one guard patrolling around down here, so... Just make sure you don't pick anything up inside of him. I've already read all four rising threats. At least I think we have. How don't I make sure? Yes, we have. That's what I thought. Good. What is it? Dragons? He's got a Falkreath jail key, which... Oh, there's a book hidden over here. The Black Arts on Trial. I believe this is an illusion skill book. Yes, it is. 
So we've got that, and if I go to free skill boosts, Illusion had six, so now it has five. Three skill books left to find, and two quests. The Black Arts on Trial by Hannibal Traven, Archmagister of the Arcane University, Imperial City. History. Necromancy, commonly called the Black Arts, has a history that dates back before recorded time. Virtually all the earliest laws of the land make mention of it as expressly forbidden on pain of death. Independent practitioners of the arts of sorcery, however, continued its study. The Sigic Order of the Isle of Arteum, precursor to our own Mage's Guild, also forbade its use, not only because it was dangerous, but their belief in the holy and unholy ancestor spirits made it heretical. Again, despite this, we hear many stories of students and masters who ignored this stricture. When Vanus Galarian left Arteum, he may have disagreed with the Sigics on much, but he also refused to allow necromancy to be taught in the Guild. Almost 1,100 years have passed since the time of Vanus Galarian, and there have been many Archmagisters to lead his guild. The question of necromancy has continued to be asked. The strictures against it in the guild have never been lifted, but attitudes about it have shifted back and forth over the years. Some Archmagisters have been inclined to ignore it entirely, some have fought very actively against it, and still other Archmagisters have been rumored to be necromancers themselves. In my new role as Archmagister of the Mages Guild, it is my duty to set policy on this matter. Though I have my own opinions on the Black Arts, I took counsel with two of the most learned mages in the Empire, Magister Voth Carlis of Corinth and Magister Uliceta Gracog of Orsinium, and we debated for two days. What follows are summaries of the salient points of the debate, arguments, and counterarguments, which led to the resolution of the Mages Guild on the subject of necromancy. Argument. Argument by Master Grakog. Necromancy is poorly understood. We will not make it disappear by ignoring it. As an intellectual institution dedicated to the study of the magical arts and sciences, we have obligations to the truth. Censoring ourselves in our scholarship is antithetical to our mission of neutrality and objectivity. Counter-argument by Master Carlis. The Mage's Guild must balance its quest for knowledge with responsible caution and ethical standards. It is not censoring a student's course of study to have him proceed cautiously and with purity of purpose. It is not limiting a student's freedom to set rules and boundaries. Indeed, it is essential. Argument by Master Carlis. Necromancy is an anathema throughout the civilized world. To embrace it publicly, the Mage's Guild would inspire fear and hostility in the populace at large. Vanus Galarian wanted this institution to be unlike the Sigic Order, which was elitist and separatist. We ignore public opinion at our own risk. We will certainly lose our charters in many places, including, very likely, the whole of Morrowind, where sentiment against necromancy is very strong. Counterargument by Master Grakog. Yes, we should be sensitive to the concerns of the community, but they should not and must not to dictate our scholarship. Necromancer, to many uneducated persons, simply means an evil mage. It is madness to limit our work because of prejudices and half-formed understanding. It is an affront to the purpose of objective study to turn our back on a subject merely because of public opinion. Argument by Master Grakog. Necromancers are the scourge of Tamriel. Whether operating independently or in concert with the Slodes or King of Worms, Manny Marco, they are responsible for many horrors, animated zombies and skeletons, and other forms of the undead. To best combat this menace, we must understand the powers of the necromancer, and we cannot do that by restricting our study of the black arts. Counter-argument by Master Carlos. No one is disputing the threat of the Black Arts. In fact, that is the very essence of my argument against the Mages Guild making it a school to be taught to our initiates. We can and should know what our enemy is capable of, but we must be careful not to step into a trap of looking too deep into his ways and making those ways our own. We do no one any good if by studying the evil ways we become evil ourselves. Argument by Master Carlos. Necromancy is inherently dangerous. One cannot dabble in it. The simplest spell requires the spilling of blood, and immediately begins to corrupt the caster's soul. This is not conjecture, but simple fact. It is irresponsible of the guild to teach and thereby encourage a sort of magical study which has proven itself time and time again to bring nothing but terror and misery on the practitioner and world. Counter-argument by Master Grakog. All schools of magicka are dangerous to the uninitiated. A simple fireball spell from the School of Destruction can cause great harm when cast by a novice, not only to others, but to the mage himself. 
The school of mysticism, by its very nature, forces the practitioner to divorce his mind from logic, to embrace a temporary sort of insanity, which one might argue is very like corrupting one's soul. Argument by Master Grakog. The guild already permits some forms of necromancy. The schools of magicka are, as we know, artificial constructs, originally formulated by Vanis Galarian to divide and thereby simplify study. They have changed many times throughout the years, but at their heart, every master knows they are all linked together. When a student of conjuration summons a guardian ghost, he is touching on the school of necromancy. When a student of enchantment uses a trapped soul, he too may be considered guilty of a black art. The school of mysticism, as I have stated before, has some kinship with necromancy as well. To state that students may not learn the ways of necromancy is to stifle common skills in the other, more historically legitimate schools of the guild. Counter-argument by Master Carlos. Yes, the schools are intertwined, but the standard spells of each school have passed the proof of time. We know that a student of mysticism, properly instructed, will not be permanently harmed by his experience. In many ways, it is a question of extremes, how far we would permit our studies to take us. Necromancy, by its nature, relies on the practitioner going further into the darkness than is wise, virtually guaranteeing his destruction. It has no place in the Mages' Guild. Conclusion The risks of studying necromancy outweigh its usefulness. The Guild does not wish to censor the study of any of its members, but it will not tolerate studies in the Black Arts except in limited form for the purpose of combating its evil adherents. This may only be done by rare individuals who have proven themselves both highly skilled and highly cautious, and then only with my express permission and supervision. Afterward, I regret to acknowledge the truth behind the rumor that Master Uliseta Grokog was more than an apologist for necromancy, she was a necromancer herself. Upon this revelation, the Knights of the Lamp attempted to arrest her at the Guildhouse in Orsinium, but she made good her escape. We have every confidence in the replacement magister in Orsinium. Though I disagreed, I respected her logical reasoning enough to include her arguments in this book, and I see no reason to remove them. It is disappointing, however, to see that her interest in the truth was nothing more than a euphemism for her slavery to the Black Arts. This unfortunate situation merely illustrates how essential it is for guild members to be wary of the lure of necromancy, and be vigilant to its practitioner's infiltration in our mage's guild. There you go. There are a ton of skill books in Falkreath. I had kind of forgotten. Alright, let's keep working our way around. This table over here, we've got... Another volume of Rising Threat, and a little bit of clutter. You'll notice that in the smaller towns, the jails are much simpler affairs. Just have this little room. But we do have the belongings chests to pick our way into. They'll both be master locked, so it's a pretty good thing I've got so many spare lock picks. Oh, come on. Got it. Alright, lock picking to 66. And the evidence chest also has a master lock. I ought to be able to crack it with as many spare picks as I have. I hope so, anyway. There we go. Alright. And I believe that just leaves the jail cell. Only being an adept lock. Now I'll break my five spare picks, and then I'll open it up. Inside the cell, you'll notice that stuff is free to take. There's no special way out of this one. You just have to... If you do get thrown in jail and want to escape, you just have to 
either successfully pick the lock or wait for the guard to come by and lift his key. Anyway, we're done in this building, so let's head to the Arl's long house. Dragons, and what do I get? Guard duty. Now, inside the long house, we have four people to deal with. Uh, the Jarl Sidgear, who we've had a quest to go speak to, sitting in our journal for a long time. We got that quest, I think, when we hit level 8 or 9. If you come here before you reach that level, he'll give you a quest to retrieve a bottle of Blackbriar Mead from him. But if you get a high enough level before you come here, like I did, you will get the quest to come speak to him, and the Blackbriar Mead quest will never happen. Uh, Let me guess. Someone stole your sweet roll. Because we've been asked to come visit him, it's very easy to make friends. All we have to do is talk to Sidgear, and everything in the longhouse will be free to take. So I'm still going to save that for last. I'm going to deal with the other three people first. So this is his house carl, Helvard. Let's pick his pockets, then speak to him. I protect the Jarl, whoever that might be. Falkreath's cemetery reminds us that war is not new here. Being House Carl of Falkreath is an honor. Treat the Jarl with respect, and you'll be welcome here. Ninja's history of service is impeccable. She truly is the steward of Falkreath. Falkreath's cemetery reminds each of us that war is not new here. That's pretty basic. It sounds like Nenya, the steward, is upstairs. So let's go deal with her next. Same deal. We'll pick her pockets, then talk to her. I'm the steward here. I serve under Jarl Sidgear and Jarl Dengear before him. Sidgear can sometimes act too quickly, but he does listen to Helvard and I. For Falkreath and I... This is just one more war in a long line. I'm the steward here. Okay. I serve under Jarl Sidgear and Jarl Dengear before him. How long have you been a steward? It was Dengear who made me a steward, long ago when he was young. When Dengear's health began to fail, young Sidgear was appointed Jarl in his stead. It was simpler just to keep me as steward. Sidgear has no interest in running his hold, and so leaves such matters to me. As for my part, I do my best to see that folk are treated fairly. Why is your cemetery so large? Many battles have been fought here over the centuries. Graves were dug and monuments built, and the town grew around these. In time, Falkreath came to be known as the hero's graveyard. Many noble jarls and renowned warriors asked to be buried here. Falkreath's reputation has faded somewhat, but the graves remain. Reminding us of the one inevitable truth of life. All right. May wisdom forever light your path. Well, stuff won't I be free to take. Yarl, whoever that uh, oh, be. no, it is already free to take. Oh, cool. Let's get started then. <clears throat> Legend of Red Eagle is not new. Neither is the Wisp Mother. I thought we had to talk to Sid Gear first, but apparently not. This is somebody's bedroom, either Nenya's or Helbert's, I'm not sure which. Oh, I almost missed those soul gems. Falkreath Cemetery reminds us that war is not new. Alright, let's head down. Let's go into this room next. We have an Imperial Legate here, since Falkreath is openly aligned with the Empire. Let's talk to him. The Legion's always looking for strong, capable warriors. If you think you've got what it takes, our headquarters is in solitude. Stay sharp. We've heard all the one-liners already. So, how does one join the Imperial Legion? Think you've got the medal, eh? Honestly. The Legion can use all the able bodies it can muster. We have our hands full. A dead king, a rebellion, and now dragons. 
Skyrim's a mess. If you're serious, make your way to Solitude. Our headquarters is Castle Dower. You find General Tullius there, commanding our forces in Skyrim. But talk to Legate Ricca. She handles the local recruiting. How do you feel about this war? You mean Ulfric's so-called Stormcloak Rebellion? The Nord Kings, oh, excuse me, Jarls. They can't seem to control their own people, so the Legion has stepped in to keep order. Sadly, the Empire's stretched a little thin these days, and we've gotten very few reinforcements. So we've been forced to recruit locally, but rest assured, citizen, we'll put an end to this uprising, and things will get back to normal soon enough. What's the Imperial Legion doing in Skyrim? Think you've Oops. got... Honestly, if you're serious, but talk to Legate Ricca. She handled... Not sure I understand the question. The Legion's always been in Skyrim. We have garrisons throughout all the provinces of the Empire. Our mission is to serve the Emperor, uphold the law, and protect the citizen. Skyrim's days are darkening, and the Legion will soon be called into service like never before. But we stand ready, as always, to meet that call. Fair enough. Until next time. All right. So, most of the stuff in this room is still stealing. Just because it's too expensive. So just be careful that you're hidden when you pick up any of the valuable stuff. What the Rebels like to forget is that the Empire's what's keeping the Dominion out of Skyrim. Here, there's another copy of the block skill book, Death Blow of Abernanit, but we found that a while ago. No problem taking all this stuff. Well, the only person in town left to talk to, well, there too, we've got Jarl Sidgear and Sent Sinding. Let's finish clearing out the rest of the longhouse first. I'm a steward here. Let's go up I here. Under Jarl Sidgear and Jarl Dengear before him. That room was the Legate's bedroom, obviously. Up here, it's the other one that's either Helvard's or Nenya's. I'm not sure which is which. Though I suspect the other one was Nenya's and this is Helvard's. It doesn't really matter. We're just gonna loot it all, no matter what. Now we'll go downstairs and clear out Sidgear's bedroom. As you'd expect, it's got more valuable stuff in it than the others do. Protect the yard, whoever that might be. Yeah, I hear you. There was an amulet of Talos hiding in there. I don't still need any of those, but pretty cool. Alright, we've got a couple of display cases here. And as with anything locked, we need to be hidden while we unlock it. Lock picking to 67. Ancient Nord Amulet. Haven't seen that before. But I don't think it's unique. I think there's more than one. Let me look real quick just to be sure. Yeah, no. This one's expert locked. That's still not too bad. Let's break my two extra picks. Just because expert really isn't bad. Maybe it's worse than I thought. Alright, now I think we're going to have three new books here. Uh, Ghosts in the Storm. Actually, that one I may have already read. I'll have to check. Nope, haven't read this one yet. Ghosts in the Storm by Adonato Liatelli. For many years now, I have traveled the length and breadth of Skyrim, writing of my experiences and my adventures. 
I have seen many wondrous sights and many strange creatures in my travels, but one encounter remains fixed in my memory, though I wish it were not. I had taken up traveling with one of the Khajiit ca trade caravans that crisscrossed Skyrim, peddling their wares outside the gates of the large cities. We were nearing Windhelm when the storm struck. It was a violent and terrible gale, one of the very worst I have seen in all my long years. The winds howled like all the Daedra of Oblivion, and the driving snow made us blind to the world. Rissad called a halt, and we staggered from the road, our hands held over our faces to ward off the stinging pellets of ice. We huddled together in the shelter of a copse of pines. There was no hope of raising our tents. The wind would tear them from our hands the moment we unpacked them. They struck at the height of the storm. There were perhaps half a dozen of the creatures. It was difficult to say as the blowing snow and howling wind overwhelmed our sight and our hearing. They were roughly man-sized, but hunched over and ugly. For garments they wore only rags and leathers. They were armed with daggers and swords of various kinds, no doubt scavenged from their previous victims. They had no noses to speak of, only long slits for nostrils. Their ears were sharply pointed, suggesting a distant kinship with the elves. With their pallid skin and lifeless black eyes, they seemed like something out of a nightmare. Bisha saw them first, but too late to save herself. So loud was her death cry, we heard it over the roaring winds. That cry saved us all. Alerted to the presence of our foes, the Khajiit drew their blades and formed a circle facing outward. The white fiends were too few to surround us completely, and the Khajiit fended off each attack. After three of the snow devils had fallen, the rest fell back and did not come at us again. The storm abated and we arrived in Windhelm, wi arrived in Windhelm the next morning. I have taken up residence in Candlehearth Hall, and I find I am quite comfortable behind the towering stone walls of the city. Comfortable, at least until I go to sleep and visions of those awful creatures return to haunt my dreams. And we've got one called The Night Mother's Truth by Gaston Bellefort. Although various works have been written on the subjects of both Morrowind's Morag Tong and Tamriel's more widespread Dark Brotherhood, there remains confusion as to precisely when and how these two famed, f these two feared assassins' guilds formed, or more specifically, when and how the Dark Brotherhood split from the Morag Tong, as the former is widely accepted to have sprung from the latter. The largest point of contention seems to be the figure of the Night Mother, a woman who figures prominently in both organizations. Through extensive research and interviews, and not inconsiderable risk to my own life, for the Dark Brotherhood holds this information sacred, I have finally solved the it's, this ages-old mystery. I have finally uncovered the Night Mother's truth. Although her name has been lost to time, the Night Mother was once a mere mortal, a dark elf woman who lived in a small village once located where the city of Breville stands now in the imperial province of Cyrodiil. She was a respected member of the Morag Tong, and like her fellow members, this woman made her trade as an assassin in service to the Daedric Prince Mafala. In fact, the woman held the title of Night Mother, reserved for the highest ranking female member of the organization. To be Night Mother of a particular sect was to be that group's matron the favorite of Mafala, both respected and feared. However, it was not Mafala who facilitated the transformation from woman to specter, but another, some would say far deeper form of evil, Sithis, the dread lord, embodiment of the unending void. Following the potentate's assassination in Second Era 324, strife descended upon the Morag Tong, and the guild was all but eradicated in Cyrodiil and much of the Empire. It was shortly after these events that the Dunmer woman claimed to hear the voice of Sithis himself. The dread lord, she claimed, was displeased. He was unhappy with the Morag Tong's lack of success. The void, he told her, was hungry for souls, and it was her destiny to set things right. And so, according to Dark Brotherhood legend, Sithis visited the Night Mother in her bedchamber and begat her five children. Two years passed before the unthinkable happened. The Dark Elf woman followed through with the Dread Lord's ultimate plan. One night she murdered her children and sent their souls straight to the Void, straight to their father. When they learned of this affront to decency, the people of the village rallied against the woman, for such an act was considered incomprehensible even for a Night Mother of the Morag Tong. In one night of vengeance they descended upon the woman, killing her and burning down the house in which the atrocity took place. And that was the end of the story, or so everyone thought. 
A little more than 30 years later, an unnamed man heard a strange, comforting voice inside his very head, just as the Dunmer woman claimed to hear the voice of Sithis inside hers. The voice identified herself as the Night Mother, and named the man Listener, the first of many. And so the unholy matron set her servant on his path. He would found a new organization, a guild of assassins known as the Dark Brotherhood, in service not to Mafala, but to the dread Lord Sithis. The Morag Tong, now surviving only in Morrowind, was an artifact of a forgotten age. The Dark Brotherhood would marry business with death. The organization would grow in wealth and power, and the void would swell with fresh souls. It was, the Night Mother told her listener, the perfect arrangement. In the early days of the Dark Brotherhood, the bodies of the Night Mother and her children were recovered from their original burial site and interred in a crypt beneath the side of her house, and there they remain even today. So if, in your travels, you find yourself in the city of Breville, and make a wish at the statue of the lucky old lady, as is the local custom, know that you stand on sacred, if evil, ground. For you stand above the Night Mother, the unholy matron herself, and your luck has just run out. And we have a guide to better thieving. This is a pickpocket skill book. Our pickpocket skill is already at 100, but nonetheless, I'll take it off the list. As for free boosts, I had four left for pickpocket, so now that's down to three. Two skill books left to find, plus one quest. Wolfmare's Guide to Better Thieving by Wolfmare Shadow Cloak. So you want to make it as a cut purse. You want to live the life of a criminal, always one step ahead of everyone and pockets brimming with septims. Maybe it appeals to you to try and earn a living by robbing some wealthy merchants or extorting your local shopkeepers? Let me give you a bit of advice. Don't bother. For every skilled thief I've met in my day, I've seen 20 who thought that they had what it took but, end up rotting, but ended up rotting in jail. But if you're anything like me, you don't listen to advice. You do whatever you want and never let anyone else tell you otherwise. To oblivion with the risks, all that matters is the coin. Sound familiar? If it does, then this book might just teach you the difference between acting like a petty thief and a master criminal. I know what you're thinking. Who's this Wolfmare? Who does he think he is telling me how to be a better thief? What makes him an expert? Simple. Maybe you heard about that heist in Mournhold, when Queen Berenziah's coronation crown went missing? Or perhaps the tale of an Elder Scroll gone missing from the White Gold Tower reached your ears? That's right. Sorry about the pause. It was yours truly. I've done just about every kind of job you can imagine, and I've got the septums put away to prove it. How else could an ex-thief find the resources to publish his own book? Now that I have your attention, let's start with two of the most fundamental skills you'll need to sharpen if you want to make it as a cut purse. Picking locks and picking pockets. And before you roll your eyes and throw this book aside in disgust, I can promise you that the easiest way you're going to get caught is by ignoring the basics. But if you can master these activities, you'll find yourself swimming in coin. Picking pockets is one of the easiest skills to learn, but you'd be surprised how often I've seen novice thieves muck it up. The lesson here is twofold. First, know your surroundings, and second, know your approach. Where and when you decide to go fishing is just as important as who you chose as your mark. Follow them a while, there's never a need to rush. Wait until they're somewhere isolated and out of earshot of any guards, but most importantly, always know when to let the mark go. Getting pinched simply isn't worth the risk. There will always be plenty of other marks who will come along with their pockets full. As far as the approach goes, don't drop into your crouch until you are completely out of the mark's view directly behind and preferably close to them. Don't spend too long deciding what you'll lift, either. A good thief should be able to hit a mark and make off with something valuable in less than five seconds. Last of all, plying this trade at night will greatly reduce your chances of getting caught. If you have no other choice and you have to do it in the daylight, just make sure you aren't out in the open. Lockpicking is an art form that takes years to master. The most important thing to remember is that no two are alike, each one behaving completely differently. As long as you keep your wits about you and your patience, you'll find them easier to defeat than you'd initially expect. Good picks are always essential. Make sure you have plenty of them tucked away in your pockets. Always take your time and keep a light touch on the picks. When the tumblers begin to fall into place, you should feel the pick tremble ever so slightly. This means you're near the sweet spot. Slow down at that point and only move the picks with the finest touch. If you blindly poke at the lock like an old man, all you're going to end up with is a bunch of broken picks and equally broken pride. 
As a last resort, if the lock is completely confounding you, there's always the option of smashing it. Just keep in mind that this is rarely successful and could potentially make a great deal of noise. By using my techniques, I'm not merely suggesting you'll be a successful thief. I'm giving you a solid guarantee. All it takes is a little bit of patience and a great deal of practice, then maybe, just maybe, you'll become as successful as Wolfmare. In my next volume, we'll move on to another important tool in your arsenal, sneaking. I'll prove to you that the shadows can be just as potent of a weapon as your blade if you know how to bend it to your will. Alright, <clears throat> that's everything, except picking Sid Gear's pocket and talking to him. So like I said, we won't have to do the rare gifts quest because of that letter we got earlier. If you're here prior to level 8, I think, you'll have to fetch him a Blackbriar Mead Get away before you me. can progress any farther. Filthy toward your Thane ship and ultimate ownership of Lakeview Manor. Come Get on, away. bro. You're not the game's just messing with me. Don't even... Filthy. No way you end up on the wrong end Get of 90% this many times Filthy. in a row. Don't even... Come on. There now, that's more like about it. it. Alright, Sid Gear. Good to see you. Finally someone useful is around. Yes, what is it that you want? Bolin speaks much about the war and the Stormcloaks, but he knows who provides. The Stormcloaks want freedom, but don't understand its price. There are opportunities everywhere. Why don't you go find them? Stand aside. I don't need to speak to you. Sidgear's kind of a jerk, but I still think he's a better Jarl than Dengear, who turns out to be so paranoid he doesn't even trust his old steward Nenya or his old personal bodyguard Lod. Sidgear is a pompous, selfish jerk, but he lets Nenya run the hold, and as far as I can tell, she's solid, so... Bolin speaks much about the war and the Stormcloaks, but he knows who provides. Alright, let's do the non-quest dialogue first. Does your inexperience make your job difficult? Difficult? I'm a Jarl. I eat the most succulent meat, drink the finest ale, and hunt with the best hounds in the hold. Meanwhile, my very capable steward sees to the needs of the small folk and ensures that my hold runs smoothly. Being a Jarl could hardly be simpler. You should try it sometime. It's like the difference between the king and his hand in Game of Thrones. How did you become a Jarl while so young? My uncle Dengir was Jarl until a short time ago. His old age and failing health caught up with him and he stepped down. He now serves us honorably as Thane, and to the great benefit of the hold, I now serve as Jarl. I got your letter. I'm Travis. Ah, it's you. Yes, well, now we'll see if the stories about you are true. There's a group of bandits in my hold that I may have had a few discreet dealings with. The cut they were giving me was good at first, but now, now it's time to clean things up. Go and take care of it. It will be done. Good. Kill the leader Execute of Ember Shard. every last bandit. Spare no one. Okay, so he's sending us back to Ember Shard Mine. And when we do talk to Sinding, he's gonna send us back to Bloated Man's Grotto. For now, I'm just gonna offload and end the video. Because we're done clearing out Falkreath. But... What to do first? I think I'll do Sinding first. Anyway, I left my horse at the back steps of the barracks, so... Let's just head over there and fast travel to Whiterun. Take the horse to Grey Pine Goods. I can sell everything that I'll be able to sell while I'm in there. And then when I get to Whiterun, I can just drop the stolen stuff and the goat horns off at Bree's home. And then we'll be done. Come on. Dismount. Dismount. There you go. 
head in the great high goods. I'll offload everything I can sell here. You'll find my brother Solov and I are the only true lords and fuck. Well met. Trinkets, odds and ends, that sort of thing. Let's see if he's got anything else I need. Much like Bellathor, he buys and sells everything. It looks like he also will not restock on goat horns. Which is okay. I'll sell him everything I have that isn't stolen. Reset him as needed. Almost there. Well, almost time to reset, I mean. Steal anything from my shop and you'll regret it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big talker. Let's see how you handle this. Ah! Help me. Help me. Ah! Not as well as Bellafor. Can I get you? Oh, a bit of this and a bit of that. Stormcloaks must not have very high standards. thing I don't want to sell him is the goat horns that I bought from him earlier. Everything else is fair game. Alright. Be seeing you, stranger. Anything else I'm carrying is stolen. Let's take it all back to Whiterun. So I have a new exploration loop in mind, but well, I haven't quite finished up Fall Grief because I still need to talk to Sending. And then Sending is going to send us to a place we've already been, like Sidgear just did. So I will do Sending's quest next. So in the next video I will speak to Sending and complete his quest, which will require me to return to Bloated Man's Grotto. What's the magic? And then, the video after that, I'll do Sidgear's quest, returning us to, I think, our very first dungeon, apart from Helgen Keith, who sent me back to Embershard Mine. And then after that, 
After that, we'll be able to buy Lakeview Manor, so I'll go ahead and buy the property. But then, I'll do a little... I'll do a new exploration loop that will terminate at my new plot of land. And then we'll build our first house. Exciting stuff, I know. Honor to you. But with this batch of goat horns, and all the saber cat teeth I found, I think I should just about have enough to build everything. The only thing I should have to hold off on, oh, well, I didn't want to stash the glass arrow. The only thing I should have to hold off on is, uh... The one shrine of Akatosh, because I don't have enough dragon scales yet. Okay, that's all the weapons. Potion of Cure Disease on hand. You have to have it on you when you hit the random encounter. Much like the Haunting Brew Mead I've been toting this whole time. Goat horns go in here. And we're offloaded. Unless Lucia's chest is full. It isn't. I am your sword and your shield. Well, one thing I couldn't help but notice is that my uh I have two extra lockpicks. I should have broken on one of those uh Too early for places to be locked? I guess. Well, let me check right quick. There we go. Let me drop my keys to War Maidens right quick. Just break these two picks. And I should have broken on that display case, but neglected to. Alright. Now let's get our keys back. I'm going to fast travel back to Falkreath. Sending is. And I'm going to end the video ready to talk to him. Alright, so let's go down to the jail.
Go cast your fancy magic someplace else. I'm gonna park right here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's the magic? I think we can pick his pocket, but I don't think he has anything. Hmm? Uh, the Cursed Ring of Hearsing. Well, we're gonna leave that alone. I'm gonna end the video here. This has been Let's Play Skyrim. Next time, we're gonna talk to Sin Ning and immediately complete his quest. I'll explain why that's necessary then, although it will be pretty obvious. After that, we'll have a repeat of Ember Shard Mine, because that's where Jarl Sidgear's quest has sent us. And after that, we'll be ready to do some new exploration. So next time, Sinding and Ill Met by Moonlight, and our second trip to Bloated Man's Grotto. Until then, thank you very much for watching, and goodbye.